I appreciate all of you coming out tonight. Um, again, really quick, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Professor Peter Calcano. I'm the director of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. Um, I want to, before we get started, I want to make sure that I um, uh, do some thank yous and send out some thank yous here to the groups that have been really supported of us this week. First of all, I want to recognize the um, AIAR Bastiat Society uh, chapter of Charleston for coming out tonight and helping us to co-sponsor uh, this event. Um, this has been a partnership that's worked out really well for us, and I hope that we continue to do this. Uh, they're, they've got their banner up here. They have also information up here. So if you want to learn more about the Bastiat Society chapter, um, I would encourage you to do so. I also want to thank um, Urban Studies Program and the Economics Department for helping to sponsor this week. Um, the, uh, uh, this June will mark the 300th anniversary of the birth of Adam Smith. So this is especially important to us to think about the fact that all this time later, his ideas still have relevancy to a variety of issues related to economics. This week, we've decided to hone in on the issues of urban economics and urban planning. Um, and so the center is, is happy to, as uh, in hosting Adam Smith, we can be one of our marquee events to talk about this topic and what Adam Smith has to say about this. Adam Smith was particularly interested in how you could elevate the lives of those who were in the most unfortunate of circumstances, how we could raise up those individuals who were at their lowest levels. And his conclusion was that markets and trade were some of the best ways to help people succeed and grow and move out of those lots. And those are still some of the important messages that we try to talk about today. And I think that's partly why we've um, honed in on this topic. Um, I want to take just a second and say a few more words about the Center, right? the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. Its mission is to advance the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. And we have a variety of programming that for the students here, I would encourage you to check out. We have information on the table um, that I would encourage you to learn more about all of the various programs that we have. Uh, we do a regular reading group that I would encourage any of our students to attend, and we have students here that are partaking in that. They can tell you about that, as well as alum who have um, uh, did that and what got them involved in some of these ideas and, and processes. Um, I do want to highlight our Market Process Scholars Program and Public Choice Associates. Those are the students. You'll see them wearing their name tags and you know, being diligent and right up front. Um, so I, I do want to highlight them and ask you that if you get a chance and you want to talk to them, please do so to learn more about what the center does. Um, at this point, I actually want to introduce one of our market process scholars, Emily Cook, to come up and introduce our speaker for this evening. Emily. Hi, as Dr. C said, my name is Emily Cook, and I get to introduce our speaker today. Um, Dr. Emily Hamilton is a senior research fellow and director of the Urbanity Project at the Mercatus Center at George Mason. She studies housing affordability and the effects of land use restriction. In addition to research, she also um, is she does policymaker outreach at the local, state, and federal levels. While at the Mercatus Center, as a research assistant, Dr. Hamilton wrote policy pieces in the Social Change Project and weekly blogs about state and local policy issues. She then served as a research associate with the CoStar Group, which specializes in commercial real estate data and analytics. During this time, Dr. Hamilton began contributing to the Market Urbanism blog, which she still does. Dr. Hamilton then transitioned back to the Mercatus Center, serving as an associate director of state outreach, a policy research manager, and a research fellow. In those various roles, she's had produced policy briefs, working papers on a variety of topics like housing affordability, land use regulations, and the relationship between walk score and home prices. In her current position as a senior research fellow, Dr. Hamilton has published research on inclusionary zoning and accessory dwelling unit policy. Throughout her career, her writing has been featured in USA Today, The Washington Post, and The Los Angeles Times. Um, Dr. Hamilton did receive her PhD in economics from George Mason University and is an alumna of the Mercatus Center's fellowship at George Mason University and Goucher College. And we are very glad to have Dr. Hamilton here with us this evening to speak about zoning reform and housing abundance. And I'm going to pass it over to her now. <laughs> 
All right. Thanks so much, Emily. Thank you all for being here this evening. And thank you to Pete for including me in Adam Smith Week this year. It's wonderful to be here in Charleston in such a gorgeous example of urbanism and emergent order in urban design um, to be talking about these issues. This is a topic that I came to care about as, I think, a, a natural-born city lover, someone who really likes an urban, walkable uh, environment, who wondered why we see so little of this type of development uh, happening across the U.S. today. It's very difficult to make room for new people in those parts of the country that are those urban walkable locations. And it's very difficult to build those types of neighborhoods new. Um, and then in beginning to work on this topic more seriously, um, I came to realize how much of an issue land use restrictions are in our own household budgets with housing being the largest cost in almost everyone's household budget and a large part of that cost doing being due to the difficulty of adding additional housing in the places where people most want to live. This evening, I will start by providing a bit of foundation on the importance of cities as providing the places where economic growth and trade takes place the types of land use restrictions and their costs in terms of making it uh, difficult and expensive to build new housing in many parts of the US. And finally, some um, glimmers of hope where we're seeing important reforms being done that are succeeding in making it possible to build more and less expensive housing in some parts of the country. So cities, um, as Alain Berteau has, has written very um, persuasively about, and you'll get to hear from him later this week, cities are really labor markets. They are places where people come to exchange. And everything that's so fun about cities is downstream of their, their role in providing the places where Adam Smith's market process can unfold. Uh, historically, U.S. cities have been really important landing places for people coming from other countries to the U.S. or from moving within the U.S. to locations of higher opportunity than, than where they started out. And we can see um, that exchange really um, taking place in this image. And while we don't often see quite such literal markets in um, our city streets today, it's still very much true that interactions and exchange um, that take place are dependent on the, the time and place where they happen. Um, if you want to work in finance, you probably aren't going to have the same opportunities to advance in your career in any place other than New York City. If you want to work in public policy or government, the spontaneous interactions that you can have in Washington, D.C. are probably unparalleled anywhere else in the country. And that place is a, a core um, piece that we, we can't separate the exchange from the location where it happens. Uh, you'll hear much more um, about Jane Jacobs if you're able to attend Sandy Ikeda's talk um, later this week. But I'll just mention one of her um, insights about what makes cities such a good place for exchange, for markets, and for facilitating interactions that wouldn't be possible in other types of environments. And she identified that certain neighborhoods have characteristics that allow for a wide diversity of people to live in them and to be there for a wide variety of reasons, making um, it possible for us to bump into someone by chance who will lead to an opportunity um, that's mutually beneficial.
And those characteristics are having at least two primary land uses. Uh, so for example, having um, retail and residential in a single building or on a single block or um, office and a, a recreational use in a single neighborhood. Having small blocks that make it uh, easy and pleasant to spend time outside and to walk between destinations. Having buildings of different ages and types. And what this generally means is also having housing at different price points. Um, if we're talking about having smaller, uh, older housing stock in the same neighborhood as newer, fancier, more expensive housing stock, making it possible for people at different stages of their life to live very close to one another, and a high density of buildings and people. Uh, Jane Jacobs uh, lived for much of her life in Greenwich Village near this um, image of uh, Washington Square Park. And this uh, picture was, um, this is a, an image from before her time of the 1920s. Um, and it really embodies all of this diversity that she's talking about. It's a uh, very, um, an area of small, pleasant streets with a wide variety of land uses. Um, there were very expensive brownstones, not far from um, inexpensive tenement apartments, meaning that many people were coming here every day um, from different places in life for different purposes and interacting with one another. But I'll turn now to some of the land use regulations um, that are, are making it more difficult to, to build this type of environment um, today. And if we were to drop ourselves down into the, the streets right next to Washington Square Park, we would see almost the same buildings that were there in the 1920s. And this is some of the most valuable real estate on earth, that there's huge demand to accommodate more people in this neighborhood over time. But rules like historic preservation and other types of zoning restriction mean that 100 years later, it looks almost the, the same as it did previously. Rather than accommodating a wide diversity of types of people today, this neighborhood by and large is only accessible to very high income people um, who can afford prices that have been, up, been bid up for a stagnant supply of housing rather than um, having an environment that can allow more people to take advantage of a limited land area over time. And I'll go into some of the um, details of the zoning rules. If you were able to come to Ryan Yonk's um, talk this morning, he talked about the process of comprehensive planning that cities use to try to identify how and where they are going to grow over time. These zoning rules are downstream of that comprehensive planning process, and they're the specific um, legally binding regulations that determine exactly what can be built where. And these rules are sometimes referred to as exclusionary zoning because by limiting how much housing can be built and driving up the cost of housing that is allowed to be built, they lead to patterns of, of urban development that shut out people from their preferred locations uh, because they might not be able to um, find housing that's affordable at their income levels because that housing is illegal to build. The bread and butter of US zoning is single family zoning, uh, which requires each house to be detached from the others around it and to sit on its own yard of a certain size as mandated by minimum lot size regulations. Uh, internationally, the, the type of development that we commonly see um, in the U.S. Is, is very rarely seen outside of here in Canada, where we um, sometimes see these very low levels of residential density within urban areas and extremely um, homogenous neighborhoods, um, often with, with only residential use, no commercial uses at all. 
And in places where land is expensive, a minimum lot size requirement sets a very high floor on the cost of building a house. Um, if you have to purchase $500,000 of land, you're not going to be able to build an inexpensive house on it. And further, having an expensive piece of land leads home builders to be incentivized to build uh, fancy large houses because there's usually not a lot of market for a basic small house on a very expensive piece of land. And when we're talking about a, a small locality that has, a, for example, a homogenous uh, minimum lot size throughout, these rules are setting a cap on the, the number of people who are um, allowed to live in this locality. We can just divide the, the land area by the uh, minimum lot size to find out what that cap is. In most U.S. localities, the vast majority of land is dedicated to single-family detached housing with only a small percentage of land where multifamily housing is legal to build. And within those areas where multifamily housing is allowed, there are lots of rules uh, similarly that limit the supply and drive up the cost of providing that housing. Rules like parking requirements, height limits, um, and limits on the, the number of units that can be built that all limit the intensity to which that land zone for multifamily use uh, can be developed. And uh, some of these characteristics of development that we see are, are not necessarily the result of regulations. We would certainly see parking um, being provided in, in lots of U.S. housing developments, even if it weren't required. But the requirements often um, add cost beyond what home builders and renters or home buyers uh, want to have. So, for example, a, a household with one car, um, for example, a, a single mom living in an apartment with her kids likely has one car, but she might have to pay for um, two parking spaces because local land use rules prevent an apartment from being built if it doesn't have two parking spaces um, to go with it. Urban um, growth boundaries are another type of important land use restriction. Uh, Charleston um, has one, as we heard about this morning. Uh, Portland, Oregon has the country's most famous urban growth boundary that has been studied extensively. These rules um, designate areas of an urban region where only agricultural or open space um, is the, the allowed land use. You can see that it has really um, visible effects here of where development is allowed versus where it's not. And in Portland, um, the, the rule has a clear effect on pushing down the value of the agricultural green space land, um, unsurprisingly, because it, it can't be put to any more valuable use. Uh, but it also drives up the cost of land inside the urban growth boundary, making housing more expensive where it's allowed to be built. And it's not just the, the rules on the books that affect the amount of housing that can be built and the cost at which that housing can be delivered. It's also the process um, through which any development has to go um, in uh, large U.S. cities today. This is an example um, not too far from where I live in Washington, D.C. This um, simple project that um, replaced a, a very dated grocery store took 10 years to approve. This includes uh, a new grocery store and 100 apartments on a very busy street in DC. It should not be a, a controversial <laughs> issue um, to get through. Took 10 years, an enormous amount of, of legal costs and holding costs on the part of the developer. And um, those, those costs are then, of course, um, all passed on to uh, renters and home buyers in the market who have to pay higher costs for housing as a result. Uh, in the 
until the last uh, decade or so, the, the really visible problems of land use restrictions and housing affordability were quite limited um, in terms of the, the parts of the country that they really affected. California and New York started seeing the, the problems that come from this environment of housing scarcity um, a few decades ago, but more recently, this problem is spreading to certainly places like Charleston, um, increasingly cities like Denver or Austin that were relatively affordable until decades of these rules and the, the very convoluted process of approving new housing supply have caught up and started creating a, a nationwide problem. And to explain a, a, a well-functioning housing market, I have a, a kind of a silly example here of hermit crabs, uh, but they actually provide, um, I think, a, a clear explanation of how a well-functioning housing market can serve people um, of different household types and different incomes. And it's a process that urban economists call filtering. And when hermit crabs grow, they have to move into larger shells over time to, to continue growing. And they organize this process by lining up on a beach and they will do this next to a shell that's large enough to accommodate the biggest crab. And then that crab will move into the, the biggest shell and every other crab will then move into a slightly bigger shell, leaving the smallest shell empty. And this is a, a similar to what we see in um, a housing market where new housing that's built tends to be fancier and bigger than other housing that, that's already on the market. And it can serve high income households um, who will move into it to either uh, rent or buy uh, a fancy new housing unit. But they'll move out of another unit and free that up for um, someone who is lower income or someone who is, is downsizing. Um, and then in turn, that household frees up uh, a typically somewhat less desirable unit um, for someone else, leading to a housing market that can accommodate people of a wide range of incomes. But we're not seeing this filtering process work well in the high cost cities in the US today. The median um, renter is spending a larger portion of their income on rent persistently decade after decade, dating back to the, the 1960s. And this is very different um, from what we see in other, um, other areas of the economy where our incomes are going much further over time and leading to rising living standards in housing, this, this scarcity that comes about due to regulations is making us effectively poorer. And this is true, as I said, increasingly across the US. This um, chart, sorry, this is a little complicated for a, a slide, but it shows that across the country from 1980 to um, 2019, the uh, median renter household went from spending 20% of their income on rent to 25%. And if we limit um, to looking at uh, what are sometimes referred to as the superstar cities in the US, these are the six regions of the country that have the highest incomes and highest productivity. The median renter is now spending 28% of their income on rent up from 22%. And this is the median. So there, 50% of people are, are spending more than that share of their income on rent, uh, often leaving them without enough left over to pay for other uh, really important needs. And this process of restricting housing supply in places where demand is highest ultimately means that not everyone whose best opportunity might be located in the Bay Area or in Boston can live there because of the, the limit on housing, people are sometimes forced to move to where they can afford housing rather than where their best job offer might be located or their best opportunity for education. A recent study 
uh, identifies that 50% of the reduced income mobility in, um, in the U.S., the slowdown in income convergence from low-income parts of the country to high-income parts of the country is due to local land use regulations. And ultimately, this means that we're all poorer because people who um, their, their best job opportunity might be located in San Francisco, but instead they move to another great city, uh, say Austin, but a city where they aren't earning as much money and aren't ultimately contributing as much as if they could access housing in the place where they could be most productive. The average American household earns $13,000 a year less than they would if the most regulated parts of the country were um, deregulated down to the level of the median American city, um, according to one um, very high profile estimate. So I've, I've painted the, uh, the pessimistic picture of, um, of land use restrictions in the US. But as I said, there are some reasons for optimism. Um, I think because this problem has gotten so bad, particularly in uh, states like California, policymakers are being forced to act. And um, we're seeing increasing experimentation at both the local and the state levels in terms of reforms that are intended to um, make it possible to build more housing at lower prices. If this is an issue you follow, you might have heard about Minneapolis's triplex reform. The city um, in 2019 made a change to their comprehensive plan and to their zoning ordinance to allow three units to be built on a lot that was previously zoned for the typical detached uh, single family house. But now that single family house can be replaced with three units. But one thing that um, we really see with housing construction, particularly this type of infill housing construction, where new development is replacing something that's already on the ground, is the details are really important. So here's an example of a duplex and a triplex in Minneapolis that were built before the city even had zoning. Um, and these would not be allowed to be built today, even though the city has legalized up to three units on a lot because they're too tall, they are too close to their lot lines, and they're just bigger than what current zoning rules would allow to be built on these lots. And so in part, as a result of these remaining restrictions, we're not seeing a lot of, of these duplexes or triplexes being built in Minneapolis, uh, certainly not as many um, as we would hope to see as a, a relative to the amount of attention that this reform has received. Some of them are getting built. Here's an example of a new triplex that would not have been possible without this reform, um, but only uh, about a couple hundred uh, duplex or triplex units have been built in Minneapolis, many fewer than I think planners there hoped to see as a result of this change. And I'll, I'll contrast this with an example from Houston. Houston is the only large US city without Euclidean zoning, which means that you can build any type of land use on any piece of land in the city. They do have a lot of, of land use regulations, but there aren't parts of the city where you can only build housing or only build office or only build apartments. Um, that, that aspect of use is um, quite unregulated in Houston. They do have minimum lot size requirements, but in 1998, Houston policymakers reduced their minimum lot size requirement from 5,000 square feet down to 1,400 square feet. Um, and so that's similar to what Minneapolis did. They're now essentially allowing three times as many houses to be built on uh, a piece of land as would have been allowed prior to the reform. But uh, because Houston is, is such a liberally regulated um, real estate market, 
you can build a lot more square footage there than the Minneapolis reform allows. Uh, so each new townhouse in Houston, if it's built on a site that used to have a single family house, each individual townhouse is usually more square footage than that single family house was. So a whole redevelopment could be four times or more um, of the square footage of what it replaced. And because Houston doesn't have that use zoning, you can build uh, this type of housing on, say, a, a dead strip mall or um, an area where there was self-storage or any type of relatively low value um, commercial use. And unlike Minneapolis, Houston has um, seen tons of this, this townhouse construction, tens of thousands of units of these townhouses have been built um, across the city. Um, you can go on Google Street View and, and see them all over the place. And they come in at all a very wide range of price points. There are very fancy townhouses close to downtown that are over a million dollars each. You can find new construction townhouses in less expensive parts of the city for under $300,000. And it, it, and as a result of its very liberal approach to land use development, Houston is a really impressive affordability story um, within the U.S. The median uh, house price there is below the U.S. median, even though it's been growing faster than the U.S. in terms of population and in terms of its economy for decades. And it, um, in terms of prices relative to incomes, it's also more affordable than other fast-growing uh, Sunbelt cities. Um, Charleston also has some, some gorgeous small lot development like what is um, legalized in Houston as a result of its reforms. But the, the land use review process in Charleston as well as um, general constraints on housing development mean that while we get gorgeous um, new single family construction like this, um, it can't deliver the, the scale of affordability relative to what we see in Houston. The um, final example of local level reform that I'll talk about is what I'll call transit-oriented development. But here I'm focusing on not the transit policy itself, but the zoning changes that are often coming about um, near uh, rail stations or bus corridors um, across some parts of the US. Oftentimes we're seeing transit-oriented development up zoning in places where there's very little residential use to begin with. Um, this is, is particularly true in the D.C. region where communities in, in Northern Virginia and the district itself have legalized large apartment buildings on formerly commercial areas. Um, so these buildings, for example, are replacing warehouses. Um, it's a relatively uncontroversial way to allow more and less expensive housing to be built compared to changing policy in um, residential neighborhoods. Seattle's Urban Villages um, policy is a, another very prominent example that has facilitated tons of multifamily construction. There's lots that DC or Seattle could do that I would like to see them, them do to make housing more abundant and more affordable. But relative to other uh, high-income coastal cities, they are, um, are relatively affordable. And we're seeing rents uh, trending down uh, in recent years in these two cities, whereas that is definitely not the case in what we might call peer cities like Boston, New York, or California cities. Again, um, Charleston has um, pursued some of these, these strategies, legalizing um, some new apartment construction in recent years, but review processes um, here are, are similar to the example that I, I mentioned in DC, where projects might take years and years to get approved, um, adding tons of cost to the construction of multifamily housing. 
And one thing we see with these um, large apartment buildings is they they um, weigh heavily on people's mind because they are such a, a visible um, sign of new construction that the um, the actual effect of of projects on housing supply might seem much larger. Um, than it is. So people might say, you know, I, I see new apartment buildings being built all the time. What are you talking about? A uh, housing shortage. But if we look at, at more objective measures, like the, the rate of building permits per capita being issued over time, we see that um, the expensive parts of the U.S. are really lagging where they were um, a few decades ago when housing was much more affordable than it is today. Uh, one um, other reason uh, that I am optimistic about improvements in this area, in addition to these local reforms, is that state policymakers are increasingly coming in to set some limits on local land use regulations. Uh, I talked about the Houston lot size um, reform and several states in recent years and this year have introduced bills that would limit lot size requirements in localities um, across their states. And I think this um, approach of bringing up some of this decision-making to the level of the state makes a lot of sense in land use questions because almost everyone can agree, like we would like US cities to be places where people of many different income levels can afford housing and can pursue their own best opportunities. But the controversy comes when we come down to the, the level of the specific neighborhood of where is this housing going to be built. And by moving this discussion up to the state level and saying, localities across our state have to make it easier to build more housing, Number one, that's going to lead to a much smaller impact on any one neighborhood than making a big policy change in a small geography would. And number two, it, um, it provides a platform where the, the benefits and the costs of new housing construction can be weighed uh, more rationally than it is often the case at the local level. Um, and localities get their authority to regulate land use from their state governments constitutionally. So when that authority goes too far, causing a widespread affordability problems, I think there's a very clear case for state policymakers to uh, step in. So cities uh, provide our location of economic opportunity um, in many cases and in many professions. This is an inherent um, fact of, of market exchange and urban development. And so it's really important that they maintain um, and become places where it's possible to accommodate economic growth and population growth over time. Um, and some um, local and state level reforms are uh, hopefully taking us uh, toward a direction of more housing abundance going forward. Thanks so much. And I look forward to any questions you all have. So we have two microphones set up on um, either side. We typically um, sort of defer to let our market process scholars have had the opportunity to ask you the first question. So I will um, turn to them and see if any of them want to ask any questions. So first, I wanted to say thank you for being with us. Um, my question is, you didn't touch the, on this a lot during the talk, but actual safety regulations and regulations for homes or apartments that are being built, like regulating their interiors and the materials that they're made out of, do you find that those contribute also to a lot of the cost of housing, or is it really these land use regulations that are causing the increase in price? That's a, a fantastic question. Um, and it's both. I think there's there's good evidence. Um, 
But one thing we that uh, separates out the difference between the cost of building new housing and um, which would, would be reflected in the building code rules um, that achieve those safety regulations versus the market price of housing, we can see that these costs are diverging over time. So the, uh, the cost of building new housing is going up, but the price of housing um, is going up much faster, reflecting the, that um, a limited supply of housing is getting bid up over time. Um, and there's also, I would say, a, a much clearer um, uh, rationale from a public policy perspective for those safety regulations. Um, a, a typical renter or home buyer might not have any idea of whether or not the, the wiring in their house is done well and done safely. Um, so there's a, a good reason that we have building codes and lots of safety regulations surrounding housing construction. I do think there's um, an important debate to be had about whether we do those rules well in the U.S. Um, looking at, at fire deaths, for example, the U.S. has um, a much higher fire death rate than a lot of European countries. Um, but we also have building codes that are more expensive to comply with. So there probably are um, opportunities there for improving building code regulations. Um, but from a pol public policy perspective, the argument in favor of um, zoning reform allows us to avoid the, uh, the uh, engineering questions that come into play with the, the building code issues. Thank you. Hi. Um, one thing that came to mind when you were talking um, was like historic preservation. We have a huge historic preservation society here in Charleston, uh, which no doubt limits our ability to grow, build new, renovate old buildings, put new ones in place, um, et cetera. So I was kind of curious, um, what do you think maybe from like a policy, like maker perspective, like do we need to be bargaining more with these historic preservation societies to kind of like loosen up restrictions? Just how should we go about dealing with that? That's another great and tough question. Um, I think the, the argument in favor of historic preservation is much stronger in Charleston than it is in a lot of parts of the U.S. that are historically preserved, but um, are getting fewer benefits from that preservation in terms of tourism, um, in terms of um, having the the level of charm, let's say, that, that Charleston has. Um, one potential solution is to put some type of cap on the number of structures that can be um, landmarked, opening up um, opportunities for development in some places and um, creating a, a requirement for preservationists and policymakers to identify what they really want um, preserved rather than having it be free to um, landmark as, as much as they would like. Um, another potential solution is something that's um, really been used in Paris, which is to preserve um, a huge um, area of the city, but to allow a lot of density in those places that aren't preserved. Um, so like serious high rises in um, a small part of the peninsula, for example, could be uh, one way to preserve large areas while allowing growth somewhere. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Ms. Hamilton. Thank you again for coming out and speaking to us today. I really appreciated it. Um, I'm one of the student ambassadors here for the School of Business. My name is McKenna Stone. And I guess my question here today, bringing it a little bit more centrally focused down to the college itself and from a student perspective, being in Charleston, you know, this is a very expensive place to live. And on a student budget, it isn't always easy, I guess, being here. So I guess I was just wondering if you could touch a little bit more on, you know, maybe some potential solutions from the college's standpoint that you could think of, or even the city to kind of allow students to have a little bit more freedom within their housing. Uh, I guess an example, my roommate and I were looking at one of the historic houses down here and the rent per person is more than my parents pay for our entire single family home in North Myrtle Beach. 
obviously, you know, there's differences in the economies between the two, but I was just wondering if you could touch on, you know, some potential solutions you could see in the future here. Yeah. uh, Another um, excellent question. And it's tough because we've gotten to this housing affordability problem over decades and the the market-based solutions of legalizing lower cost types of construction like apartments um, are also going to take a long time to ultimately um, bring down affordability, um, bring down rents. And we see from examples within the U.S. uh, like Houston and other um, Sunbelt cities that it is possible to grow and uh, reach affordability, but it's in a place like Charleston that's suffering from a very serious um, problem right now, that's not a a near-term solution regardless of what policymakers might do on the land use front. So I would certainly encourage um, in the the Charleston uh, context, identifying places where um, more multifamily housing can be built in a streamlined uh, process in the near term, uh, but ultimately to improve um, short-term student affordability, I think that uh, perhaps something on the university's end uh, in terms of, of building more housing might be a more viable uh, short-term solution. Awesome. Thank you. And I guess just a follow-up to that, how would you say that the college's uh, presence on the peninsula affects like the housing market for other people who are looking to move here who aren't related to the college? College towns um, often have a lot of housing affordability tension, I would say, where students uh, themselves are struggling with with housing affordability and also, in a sense, causing uh, affordability challenges for for other people in a context of very constrained supply. Uh, We also see that that college towns are often um, some of the the most regulated uh, parts of the U.S., and I think this might be in part caused by the, the academics who live there. Uh, Boulder, Colorado, um, as as one example um, from my home state, has some of the most um, strict land use regulations in the country and has for decades. Um, And that that tension really comes about as a result of the tightly constrained supply of housing. If we were in a, a world where home builders were freer to provide housing for for people um, at a wider range of incomes and a wider type of housing, um, something more like a college dorm, but not uh, necessarily built by a university, we would see much less of that tension. Awesome. Thank you so much. I have two questions from online and they're together, they they kind of follow along. So the first one is, are not the upper class homeowners who use zoning rules to protect the value of their property being rational, even if the side effect is less efficient regulation? That's the first one. And the second one is, furthermore, would not harmful changes in zoning potentially constitute a taking by the government requiring compensation? Um, So to to the first question, uh, yes, I think homeowners uh, very often are behaving um, rationally. And there is some uh, literature that points to uh, the 1970s when the um, U.S., uh, another time period when there was uh, high inflation, that was um, some of the start of the homeowner activity that we see today in terms of homeowners actively um, pursuing and, and lobbying for zoning rules that would make it difficult to build more housing. Um, but we um, see the, these types of efforts to constrain supply um, in other markets and call them cartels. Um, and usually don't talk about them as a, as a great thing, uh, certainly not for the consumer. Um, and I would argue that that's the, the case in um, housing markets as well, even if it's individually rational on the, the part of the homeowner to seek um, to raise their own property values, or even just to pursue um, land use regulations that keep their neighborhood the way they like it for, for lots of understandable reasons. 
Um, nonetheless, these regulations are having huge economy-wide um, effects that I think calls into question um, how, how wise it is to pursue them. Um, I am not a lawyer, so my, my ability to answer the, the second question is limited, but my understanding is that uh, takings require um, taking away property rights. Um, and when we're talking about a land use deregulation that um, will increase the, a property owner's uh, ability to develop their land or put it to more uses over time, that's um, a regulatory givings that uh, would not generally require um, compensation in my understanding. And there's also... Um, when we're, when we're talking about a small area of land where a regulatory change is going to increase the allowable development, uh, what we see empirically is that in many cases that increases um, land value. So even though um, homeowners as a whole are um, raising the, the value of existing housing with uh, land use restrictions, they're also depressing land values uh, because they are, are, are limiting what can be built on their own land. So if we're talking about a small area where a, an upzoning is going to increase um, the option of development, the change in, in overall property value, I think is likely to be positive, not negative. So I'm going to take the prerogative of asking the last question. Um, you mentioned the fact that, you know, we have single family housing um, and that is not common elsewhere and that it wasn't common early in the history of the U.S. Right? So where did that change come from that we started to move from multifamily to sort of single family? And, and uh, historically, where did that change come come from? Sure. Um so there, there, um, there's single family housing and um, single family development in, in many parts of the world and throughout U.S. history. But the low densities that we see with U.S. minimum lot sizes combined with single family zoning within urban areas is what's really so unusual. And it's a very ugly history in, in the U.S. that has, has brought about these um, regulations. We first started seeing these exclusionary zoning rules pop up after the um, Supreme Court ruled that race-based um, zoning was unconstitutional. And localities then turned to, um, to uh, minimum lot size rules and single family zoning, sometimes with the, the stated intent of achieving um, uh, racial segregation in a, a constitutional way that did not explicitly um, segregate land by race. Um, and the uh, Commerce Department under Herbert Hoover um, advocated for that. Now, that's certainly not um, the intent of, I think, you know, the, the vast majority of local policymakers or people who support um, the status quo in, in zoning today, but that um, is, is clearly where it originated in the U.S. So we'll go ahead and um, have everybody take one last opportunity to thank Dr. Hamilton for um, coming out tonight and sharing with us uh, uh, this talk.